Welcome to Leadership and People. This is a series that pulls back the curtain on leadership by interviewing CEOs, senior executives, and entrepreneurs who've had large exits. We ask these experts about how they built trusted networks to rapidly grow their companies and what advice they wish they knew if they could do it all again. Today on the show, we've got Jeff Rust. If you're wanting to build a relationship with someone or you're wanting to be better, you have to learn to discover an individual's needs and wants. And as you discover those needs and wants, the reason that you're doing it is to gain an understanding so that you can find a way that you can serve those needs and wants. Jeff, thanks for making time. You bet. Great to be here. So I'm kind of excited because this whole mini series got started, you know, a conversation between you and I, I don't know, eight months ago, nine months ago, yeah. something like that, right? Um, That's right. And we've had so many people on from from your community, from Corporate Alliance, all these different CEOs. So it's fun to actually have a co-founder right here on the show today. Um, so for people who are listening who may not be from Utah, um, not as familiar with Corporate Alliance, can you give us just a few stats, how long you've been around, you know, all these these big name companies that, that have joined your community and, and uh, just a few stats? Yeah, you bet. So we, we started 18 years ago. And honestly, we thought a couple of years, we're going to blow this thing out across the country. And it, it took a few more years than we thought. And, and uh, we, we have five locations, in different parts of the country. And it's, it's been a, a real whirlwind with, with uh, a couple thousand different clients. And I would have to say that the, the best part of that is not so much in the numbers as it is in the personal stories of each of these successful leaders. Yeah. So um, I always get in trouble with Logan when I think when I call it a CEO club because you know that's who I'm hanging out with from your community. But help me understand because you guys have the you know all the different kinds of executives involved. How do you actually describe what what you're doing? Because it's not one of these like, hey, come to a networking event and put your business card in a bunch of people's hands kind of thing. Yeah, you know, I, I would have to say that all of us that have been in leadership positions feel that it's lonely at the top. And so that resonates when, you know, as you talk about a CEO club, CEOs definitely feel and understand that. But especially with the onset of technology, every single role and position inside of organizations feel some sense of loneliness. And so, you know, we have different different groups and, and different settings, different events where we can help humanize the experience and give people a peer to peer kind of conversation where they can deepen some relationships to improve not only their business life and their business acumen, but also, you know, their personal life with some relationships, friendships that can come as a result. Yeah. Well, and I think we should talk about that a bunch on the show. You know, you guys have, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a conference junkie. I like going to conferences. I like going to events. I like, um, any kind of like where you can get the right people in the room going to those kind of things. And so in the last, you know, however long I've been hanging out with you guys, you, you do something really different and no wonder you have these like clients that stay with you guys for years. Um, and I think for listeners today, especially anybody in business to business, you know, being able to win the undying love from corporate America, senior executives is, is obviously a highly profitable thing in business today. Um, you know, I know we were, talking a little bit before the show, like, I'd love to have today be a bit of like, what if we thought about, you know, the CEO that today's corporate executive is like this exotic animal and like the animal, the animal handling skills, right? Like, how do you, I'd love to hear like the mistakes you made and what you wish you knew 15 years ago about um, really how not treating them like a walking ATM machine ends up being such a good business strategy. Cause that's, obviously you guys have taken the exact opposite tactic. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's a great question. And, and the interesting thing is I was talking to, to Jim Farrell, one of the, the managing partner of the Arbinger Institute. And, and, and he said something to me, he goes, Jeff, you guys have a real interesting situation in the fact that you have to sell corporate executives on the fact that it's all about return on investment. They're going to spend time and money and they're going to come and they're going to meet the right people. And it's going to be incredible. And so you almost describe it, as a transaction, and then immediately, as, as soon as they're involved, you you have a culture and a way of actually changing that. And uh, the component that comes into play is, yeah, we, we have to convince people there's return on investment, but the strategy with which that is happening, or the, or the way that it's executed, I would say, is through real relationships. And real relationships don't happen in a transaction. 
it happened through a humanized effect. And, and uh, there was an example that Ernst and Young hired us to do an event. And we were, we were coaching up their managing partner because they didn't want to actually hand the microphone for the facilitation of the connecting element that we were going to do for them over to us. They said, oh, no, our managing partner will actually run that. Just coach them. Said, Great. We coached them up. And uh, the key component that we're trying to do is we're trying to get people to share something personal in a way that isn't awkward. And, uh, and so you, you do that through, you know, starting it off with an example. And, and so I coached him up and, and I said, now, just so you know, I'm going to be here if you have any questions or anything. And, and, and if you get to that point that you just don't feel comfortable, you can hand the mic over to me. I'll take it from you. And, oh, no, no, no. We got it. We got it. And we get probably, you know, a few minutes out from, from the start and they go, oh, I think we're going to have you guys do it <laughs> and, and hand the mic over. And, <laughs> and, and, and the beauty is, is that as you, Start and set the tone with a personal story that causes people to feel something. They lean in, you know, and, and it's almost like, you know, Brene Brown talks about vulnerability as a strength and how so many men and corporate executives, you know, we don't want to be vulnerable because that's a weakness. But yet when we actually demonstrate it, people lean in and, and relationships are forged in that vulnerability area. And that's really all we're trying to do is, is create an environment where that can happen that's not awkward. You know what, though? I think there's a lot of other people that could talk the talk about what you're saying, you know, and like, um, I, I think, I think for me, like when I actually believed you guys could do that. So Ted Broman is the one who talked me into joining, right? He's like, listen, uh -huh. cause I, you know, here's this guy, you know, doing with these, you know, <laughs> businesses that have many, many, many zeros behind them. Right. And I'm like, okay, whatever this guy says, that's what I'm going to do. And he's like, you got to go hang out with these people. And he's like, here's the secret though, Jess, the lunches are great and all go on the trips, go spend three days in like a, you know, go spend three days and actually build, build real friendships with these people. The, the lunches are nice. That's great. Go on the trips. And I was like, okay. And, uh, it's funny because the, the lunches are great and you make some friends and sometimes you have like a, a good connection, but it's something about that. Like whether we're in, you know, I think last year I went to San Diego with you guys, went to Coeur d'Alene. I went to the Squamish, whatever that cool lodge was on the waterfall anyways. And it's like when you sit there and hang out long enough with these people and somebody like you has started off with a, a real example instead of a look at how cool I am example, it does, it does make it safer for somebody else to do that. And then once two people have done that, then it's real easy for the third. By the time you go around the circle, you are like, you're past the like, oh, I need to, I'm trying to attract, you know, like, I know we're not supposed to try to get business, but at this event, I really am hoping to get business. So I need to put on a show and all of a sudden the show goes away and it becomes like real. What do you, do you see it different? You see it that way? You know, I absolutely do, you know, and the component that comes into play is we have to instill confidence and there's nothing more confident than someone who's authentic. The challenge is, is that we, we don't want to come out and have everyone air their dirty laundry because, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't have to do that, but there are strengths and weaknesses that individuals have just so often if we can, if we can couch it in a way where they can talk about the 5% that's, that's really working for them. And then the 5% that they're really struggling on, everyone can resonate with the, with the 5% that people are struggling with because we've all struggled with something. And that's where the relationships are forged. And, the, you know, the 5% that's going well, we want to celebrate that with them. But, but you can't help someone. And, and in, in the helping of someone is where the relationship is forged. And so that's why you have to have some sense of vulnerability that's brought out, you know, because – Superman, and I heard someone share this example with me, Superman didn't build relationships. It was Clark Kent, you know, because the, the, the individual that has no flaws, it's hard to relate to that person. It's interesting, though, because think about that balance beam, right? You fall off the balance beam one way, you're airing dirty laundry, you, you fall off the other way, and you're this wooden, you know, non-relatable version. Um, any advice for people who are saying, yeah, hey, I realize maybe I approach things a bit transactionally and I do want to build a relationship, but I do, but I am also concerned that the client sees me as credible. Any advice for the rest of us who want to do a better job at walking the balance beam in the middle? 
Well, I think we all all need. To, you know, I look at this and I think, you know, corporate alliance for me was an opportunity where I could get better at this. You know, and so I'm in no means, you know, somebody who has it all figured out. It's it's just that I'm willing to practice every day, and I have a system and a structure that allows me to practice with our clients every day, and so. The, the component that I would say is it really boils down to a couple of things. Um, you know, we teach a principle called learn, serve, grow. You, if you're wanting to build a relationship with someone or you're wanting to be better, you have to learn to discover an individual's needs and wants. And as you discover those needs and wants, the reason that you're doing it is to gain an understanding so that you can find a way that you can serve those needs and wants. And not, and not hoping, you know, tit for tat, some kind of a return, because that that's a trade. You're actually serving them to just, be generous and to, to build on that relationship. And, and then the law of reciprocity kick, kicks in and, you know, the relationship has an opportunity to grow. And, and it's, it's not a linear, it's, it's more of a circular. You do this over and over again. Um, the easiest thing I would say to somebody is if they're wanting to start, the easiest place to start is with a thank you card. You know, pull out a thank you card, think of a name and write down. And if you're not a great writer, just write their name down and put, these are three things that I like about you and, and three bullet points that are authentic and true to the individual. And then you sign your name and you send it and something will happen in you. You'll feel something towards that individual. And obviously they'll feel something too when they read the card. And, and the key component is, is how do you get people to be able to do that in the face-to-face -face interaction? Uh, and, and we do it with business because business isn't, isn't so touchy feely, you know, it's, it's more around the transaction but there are very many needs and wants that individuals have in their business. You know, it's just seeking out what are the needs and wants that I can help serve in those capacities. But, but the feeling is the same. It just will, it will strengthen a business relationship. Why do you think, you know, I'm thinking about some of the, the friends that we've got in common, you know, many of the people you've introduced me to. Um, but why do you think you look at somebody like, Ted Broman or Jim Bennett or these people who it is such a non-transactional thing when they're giving me advice, right? Um, it's like, it's such the long game. It's such the long-term thinking. Uh, and it obviously, you know, has built them the businesses they've got. Why do you think so many of the rest of us can't overcome the temptation to like, figure out what to do so I can help, so I can get business right now, short-term thinking. Well, I've, I've got five boys and uh, they're ages seven to 15. And, and there's a saying that I've heard, you know, one boy, one brain, two boys, half a brain, three boys, no brain at all. So there's lots of, <laughs> you know, crazy things that happen in our house with, with, with these boys. But one thing is always consistent is that when there's a job to be done, they always are looking for the shortest way to get it done. You know, what's the shortcut? And I think that, you know, we're all wired that way. And so, Efficiency. so uh, the, the piece that I see in, in the examples that you've given with Jim Bennett and, and Ted Broman is that they've been disciplined enough to understand that, that unlike my son at times, I'm hoping that they're better now, mows the lawn and doesn't do it very well. And we go out and we look at it and I say, you know what, you got to do the job right. And then they have to mow it again. That actually takes longer and is more work and is more tiring than having done it the first time right. And I think that's where, you know, excellence and, and successful leaders, you know, that, that understand that if you build relationships and you, and you care about relationships, that there's a right way to go about doing it. And, and that authentic way will actually produce greater results and be more efficient um, than, than trying to take the shortcut. You know, I want to, I want to go back to something you said about, you can just get started with thank you cards. Um, you know, it is kind of like a lost art these days, right? Um, when's the last time most of us received like a handwritten thank you card, you know, not digital, right? Um, I had this college professor 20 years ago, my English professor at university, he did, he talked to us about that. And then he actually did that through the semester. I got like three different notes from him and they were like, they were specific. I don't think I've had a personal handwritten note from any other professor of my entire <laughs> or school teacher through the career, you know, personal like that. And I ended up, I, I, uh, at the last company I used to work for, I hired this woman who, um, she'd, she'd been a part of the 
naval special warfare community and then flown the Navy version of Black Hawk helicopters and then ended up working for this three-star admiral. And she like had gone and bought a book on handwritten thank yous and the best way to do it. And she like, she really made me a convert to like how that extra bit of thoughtfulness and specificness and in a way that not everybody expects perfunctorily, like just what an advantage it was for the admiral for her to help get those written for him and, and uh, help him decide what should be on them. Um, why do you think, do you think it's just back to efficiency again, that, that not many of us do something like that? Well, it's, there's a couple of excuses that we all give ourselves of, oh, I don't have good handwriting. I don't have time. You know, I don't have any stationary handy. But but uh, I think that that's part of the reason that the card means so much. You know, and I have I have plenty of friends and, you know, I've got a friend who's a congressman now, John Curtis. And John Curtis's handwriting, self-admittedly, is not great. And uh, <laughs> John and I worked closely together for a, for a number of years. And and uh, I can tell you, when he sends a card to people, people feel like it really meant a ton. And and it may only be two or three lines in really messy handwriting, but it's the time that it represents. And I think that's probably where so many of us fall short because we don't feel like we have the time to be able to do that. Well, you 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 make the time for the things that matter the most to you, and and it just sends a message that I care. And I. I don't know. I'm, I'm a believer. I was raised that way. My mother, you know, is, is a diehard thank you card writer. You know, sometimes I, I get so many thank you cards from her. I say, mom, you don't have to thank us for everything all the time, but truly it, it does. It, you feel something when you write one and you feel even more when you get one. And, and, uh, and I think I, I, I do agree with you. It's a lost art. I'm just actually taking some notes down <laughs> about what you just said. Cause I, because it's so true, you know, but isn't it almost like a, a greater expression of what's underneath? You know, I went on the, I went on a trip to uh, New York with, with uh, John Curtis. Um, and uh, it was funny. He, he gave us all <laughs> these like crazy socks and he's like, I, I got really into crazy socks for wearing them at, in business at work. So I brought a pair for each of you. And it's funny because it was like, it was pretty authentic, you know, like I'm not surprised to hear that that guy writes thank you cards, you know, like it's, it's almost like a, an expression of like a deeper discipline internally. Would you, how would you say that different or do you disagree? You know, I, I can't remember. <laughs> I just, I would say that the, the component that comes into play is that it's a deeper sense of authenticity because you're giving of that most valuable resource your time. Well, let's talk about that because, you know, it's almost like a badge of honor these days in business to let people know you're important because you are so tired and you are so busy, right? Um, mm, when in reality, true. we all we all only have 24 hours a day. Like, it's not like the people with a higher paying job somehow have less hours in the day, right? It's all about decisions of allocating that time and, you know, having the guts to say no instead of like, the likable trying to win like the likable boy scout badge of saying yes to everything. Right. Um, right. When, I mean, you obviously are, you know, co-founder of an organization that has individual relationships with hundreds of high profile senior executives. Um, talk to me about time management in your mind, knowing that it takes time to build these relationships. The business won't grow if you don't build the relationships and that tug of war for you. No, I, I would say that early on when we were, you know, I was, I was 23 when we started the business and Jared was 28. And, you know, the one thing that we felt like we had a lot of at that point was time and energy, you know, and as we, as we were working with these senior executives, that was the biggest challenge. And, and we just said to him, you know, we, we all aren't as young as we used to be. And, and, uh, how do you stay fit? And they talked about, you know, how they had an exercise routine that was, you know, anywhere from 15 to 15 minutes to 60 minutes, you know, a day or every other day that they did. And, and we talked about, you know, this relationship currency and we talked about how relationships were one of the most important things in their business and in their lives. And we asked if they had dedicated time for it. 
And most of them said no. Or, or do you have a dedicated system? And so the component that comes into place, the first thing is you, you've got to set aside some time. You know, whether it's 10 minutes, block it off on the calendar, whether it's 30 minutes. And and then in that time, you can determine how you're going to invest in it in, in others. You know, whether it's going to be researching some articles relative to to a friend that you want to send something you haven't talked to in a long time, you send them some articles. I saw this and it reminded me of you. I really appreciate the, the memories we shared, you know, 20 years ago or what have you. It's that time investment in those relationships that, that comes back in spades. And if you don't block it out, it'll never happen. And uh, it, so what it, it doesn't yeah, what have is, to be your whole day. It, it can be 30 minutes a day. What does blocking it out look like for you? Because it's one thing to talk so, about it and there's, so few of us that actually do that. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's, it's two things and there's different times of the day that it makes sense for me, but the best time for me is the morning. And I have a, I have a morning routine that I try to follow and coming out of, I have some time that I spend meditating in a steam room and my head is fresh and there are thoughts that can come out that right after that is my absolute best time for, for relationship management. It's interesting, the idea, too, of putting the important things first before the vortex of your day can suck your good intentions away, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> it's funny how what you're saying doesn't sound revolutionary. It doesn't sound like, oh, this shocking thing. I never would have thought of building relationships, right? Jeff, um, Jeff in, that, in that spirit, can I interrupt you and just yeah, share yeah. something? So, I, you know, I grew up in a small town. A uh, small farming community, and when my my grandfather was a was a cattle rancher, and when I went back, and he's like, "Now, Jeff, what do you do for a living?" And I and I tried to describe it to him and my grandmother, and they're like, "Um, so you mean people pay money to come and meet other people so that they can become friends?" Now, this is coming from a small town community where there's, you know, 250, 300 people in the community. And so everyone knows everyone. And and then there's adjoining towns. And even the eight adjoining towns make up, you know, 2,000 people total that everybody knows. And they're like, this is insanity that people would pay to get to know other people. City, you know, you know, as a, as a country folk, city slickers were a bad thing. And then city folk are even dumber than I thought. <laughs> and and I look at that. It isn't revolutionary. It's been around. Obviously, relationships are pivotal. But you know, the, the, the busier we become and the more isolated we become be, because of technology, the farther away we come from our roots and the more revolutionary it actually seems to those that, that are far from it. Well, I think what's easy about yours is because it's scheduled and because it gets on a calendar and because there's such a business imperative for it that it's more likely to happen. But I think there's way more of us that could benefit from the hey, get this done first thing in the day before checking email, kind of the personal aspect of that, right? Um, right. So, but I want to I want to go back, you know, and, and I know we need to, this this half of the episode is, is almost up, but I want to go back to this thing of um, build relationships, take the time, you know, we make, we make time for, for those things that mean the most to us. Um, People have read that in books. People have had some like corporate trainer spout that off at the front of a room after his PowerPoint, right? But you have, I was just looking on LinkedIn. We've got like, I don't know, 92 mutual connections, you know, okay, right? And I just think about the way people interact with you. And you've obviously taken it to a level that um, you've, you've obviously walked the walk to a level that many of Many of us in the business community haven't. Um, do you have any tips? I mean, like, I it probably just, you know, it's probably some great standard answer, like practice and repetitions. But um, can you talk a little bit about what's going on in your head of, like, paying a deeper price of investing in people than maybe uh, is, is common? Like, what do you attribute the, like, the, like, <laughs> the radical devotion, like your friends, the people in the corporate alliance community, just other folks that I know, you brought up Jim Farrell, who I used to work for, right? You have like this uncommon magnetism and like people willing to do stuff for you. Um, do you have any, do you have any tips for the rest of us who want to generate more of that or any like 
you know, internal philosophy that you think has, has created that at this on average level for you? Well, that's, that's kind of you to say those things. I, you know, I, I feel really, really fortunate to, to have a lot of friends. And the one component that probably goes back when, when I was in school, I was never the, the brightest guy, but I was always really good at, at, at becoming friends with those who could be successful or, or, and being a part of their group and, and, and trying to help create, you know, the synergy inside of the team you know, as we work together as, as teammates and different things. And, and I would have to say that that's probably been the, 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 I don't know, it's the secret, but it's been for me something that's been a real, a real blessing. And that is the fact that, that if I can connect up successful individuals or even just good people in general, that I'm going to be guilty by association and that the opportunities are going to, are going to flow back to me in some way, shape or form. And they, and they flowed back to me in spades and, you know, I, I look at it and you, you don't really know how strong your network is or, or your or your friends or whatever until it's tested. And it's tested at a time of trial. And that time of trial, you know, in a business world may come when your business just fails or when you lose your job or in your personal life. It may be when when your spouse or one of your children are sick. And, and that's the part when it's really tested. And uh, you it's it's too late at that point to go and build those relationships but at that time you're at least you get to see how strong or weak they are and you can resolve to be better at it you know the next day and you know for the next time of trial that's great well listen um i think this is a good place to end part one of the interview um why don't we why don't we go for for a closer here why don't we go for either um the best advice you ever received or something you wish you could tell yourself 20 years ago? You know, something I wish I could tell myself 15 years ago is that it's worth getting up early in the morning and it will pay off, you know, because when, when you're just grinding um, early on, you wonder if you'll ever see the light of day. And it, it always does pay off that every, every drop of water that you're investing in other people will come back to you in spades. That, that would be the piece of advice I would give myself. Love it. Okay. Everybody tune back in. We're going to, we're going to ask Jeff some more ideas on the, on the second half of the interview about how can the rest of us build uh, more loyalty from our customers and uh, w how running 3,500 meetings and events has uh, taught us some things you can't learn any other way. Thanks for making time, Jeff. Catch you in a minute. Thanks.